Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Steel City Styrene Mountain. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is a little uh, inside the shipping crate. We're going to be doing a little looks at uh, what I've been uh, getting in here recently. Got a box from HLJ today, uh, a few things off eBay, um, a dryer buzzer going off. I should probably go over there and turn that off and recycle it so that I can get my pants clean for work tonight uh there's more information you probably needed to know but hey we're rolling here <laughs> i ain't stopping this and re-recording it i'm tired um what we're gonna be doing in this video i said we'll do a little bit out of the uh, shipping crate i'm gonna go onto the other camera so that i can set it up and just display uh you know over in this area over here so that i don't have the whole things in front of my face uh, and then I want to uh, talk about a question the CT Speed Shop had asked with regard to um, uh, making a base for uh, displaying your models. Uh, it's not something I personally have done much of. I had a custom-made, and this is back in like the 90s, custom-made plexiglass case that I had done for the one car that I built that won the most awards, which isn't saying a lot, like five things, that different car contests. I took it to one year as a junior, one year as an adult, so that tells you how long ago this was. But, you know, it won me awards pretty much everywhere I took it, uh, and Scale Auto Enthusiasts had this place that would, would, you know, it wasn't really custom make it because they were just, you know, one size you know, fits all kind of things, but they were much bigger display cases than the actual, like, a Johan box or an AMT display box where they're real narrow and have, like, a big, you know, step lip that the thing sits on top of because it's designed to stack on top of one another. This was real thin, uh, like, uh, I don't want to say plexiglass, but real thin, uh, like, uh, uh, plexiglass, probably what it really was. And then on the bottom, I had a mirrored thing, but the, it was real, real thin, like maybe, like, you know, like this thick. And it was mirrored, so I would just take the, the, the uh, you know, top off and display it on the contest tables on this mirrored base. Uh, he's talking more about uh, making a base that has grass and rocks and sand and stuff like that, so, uh, you know. I'll, I'll go into that more because it, I want to talk about uh, a larger plan that I have uh, overall for sort of a photo backdrop, uh, a diorama that it probably won't ever leave the house maybe once a year for our car show that my club puts on. We do, well, we do two. We do one in the, around Memorial Day that is attached to a real actual car show, and then we do our model contest, which is coming up here at, at the beginning of March. Um, beyond that, I don't expect it to leave the house because it's going to be probably at least half a sheet of plywood. So uh, that's a little bit bigger than what he's talking about, but I just want to talk about uh, his idea and uh, the pitfalls that it may have uh, if you're talking about using it as a contest base as well as uh, my you know overall ideas. So anyway, guys, we'll be on the other camera in a second. Be right back. All right, guys, welcome back to our fancy new camera. All right, so this is the first kit we're going to talk about real quick. This uh, was an eBay purchase uh, for a ridiculously low amount of money. Uh, I've said in uh, other videos, I uh, occasionally will uh, get a little bit of flicker there. Uh, I will occasionally take uh, the eBay listings and put them into a... Um, format where you just put the time ending soonest and this happened to be coming up in like an hour and uh i can't tell what the yen price of this one this would actually have been at the time when this kit came out because there's uh model rectifier corporation logos over the barcoding but uh suffice it to say it was uh i believe cheaper than the actual kit would have been even with the uh supremely good exchange rate that we have going on right now um this is a very basic curbside kit. It's maybe about 50 parts or so. Um, but it does, and it mentions it nowhere on this list of items here, it does have left-hand drive, and uh, it is U.S. spec left-hand drive because the other license plates that they're all for this kit are California. Uh, there was a period of time when this kit was around um, without opening it. I'm not sure what gear this is from i don't see a copyright on it anymore but uh the uh late 80s through mid 90s or so the uh 
a lot of the kits that could be uh, built in a U.S. spec, like the uh, Supra and the uh, Fairlady 300ZX and stuff like that, uh, included a California license plate because, of course, the uh, Tamiya USA plant, if you want to call it that, the Tamiya USA warehouse is in California. Funny how that works. Uh, so, like I said, it's real basic curbside. Nothing uh, particularly special about it in the uh, sense of, like, you know, oh, my goodness, you need to rush right out and, and go buy this. Uh, but it is, you know, just a neat little uh, slot f uh, filled in my uh, Celica collection. I have, like, a 7th gen and a 6th gen, and this is a 5th gen, and I have, like, a 2nd gen, <laughs> or actually a 1st gen Celica, two of 1st gen Celicas. So, uh, you know... There is a Hasegawa version of the same generation, fifth generation Celica, that's uh, done as a GT4. That is buildable only as a Japanese domestic market kit. Uh, both this kit and the Hasegawa kit were both really done to make bases for rally cars. Uh, and the, the street stock version sort of was something that came along because, well, you already had all these parts, so might as well do something with them. Um, and that's the same way the Hasegawa kit is. The Hasegawa kit was designed for the rally uh, car models, and uh, they happen to do a street stock version of it, too. That kit was released in a limited edition run here, oh, two, three years ago. Uh, it's been out of production. There, you know, it was there for a year, six, eight months, maybe a year total, and then it was gone. My local hobby shop still actually has one sitting around someplace in the back. Um, speaking of my local hobby shop, I picked this one up at my local hobby shop. Uh, been sitting around so long that this little clear window that you <laughs> that uh, you should see the body is still in one piece is de-adhesived from the uh, box top. And then I always keep my instructions on top of the box because uh, I like to be able to fish them out at a moment's notice without, uh, you know, digging around for them. This is the Fujimi Ferrari 288 GTO. This is an enthusiast series kit. You can probably see or maybe you can't see, but down here... <laughs> 250 parts, a ridiculously large quantity of parts for a uh, Ferrari of any sort, let alone this uh, homogenization special. Uh, these cars, in reality, if, I, if I've read the history of them right, uh, were based on the uh, 308, and they created uh, a bunch of these to run in Group 2 rally racing, and then there were some deaths in Group 2, uh, the sanctioning body killed the entire group two sanctions and so they had 572 of these laying around uh, and they decided to just sell them all as street cars and so this is a you know basically a race car <laughs> for all intents and purposes without a roll cage in it um, this kit itself has been out of production for quite a little while uh, probably about four or five years but my local hobby shop again had had this just sitting around and while I, I had looked at it for like the last year literally a year I've been looking at this kit I'm trying to think when I started working there compared to what it is now. Yeah, I've been looking at this kit for a year. Uh, didn't really like the price of it necessarily because it was, uh, you know, more than this cost in yen. And I, you know, <laughs> I'm one of the people that if you tell me the yen price of this kit, then that's what the kit should cost in dollars. I'm willing to give you the exchange rate difference at this point. But, you know, this is like th like 3,500 yen, so it should cost $35. Their price was more than that, but then there's a 15% discount involved. And so uh, I went around and I looked, and like I said, sure enough, this is out of production for like two, three years now. And uh, so I started putting it in my eBay watch list and to see if I could find any that would come up for cheap. And, uh, yeah, so I bought this at the local hobby shop for about $20 less than the cheapest one I've seen in a month and a half. These kits uh, go on eBay for like uh, 50 $60 cheap. And they run, you know, insane prices from there, but nobody's going to really pay that much. But baseline, if you want one of these kits, you're looking at, like, spending 50 60 bucks unless you can find somebody who has one who doesn't want it anymore. Because then, you know, prices are negotiable and you can always trade for stuff. So that gets us into what came in the Hobby Link Japan box today. Uh, all the stuff is uh, things that I had to ship. It, it, it had gotten to their 60-day uh, period. Uh, most of them, with the exception of the two uh, Mountain Pass cars, that will you know, I'll mention what they are specifically as I put them up here, 
Um, they're all stuff I bought over the Black Friday sale, so the prices were uh, you know correct, so to speak, on them. Uh, the one that is not a Fujimi kit out of this stack is this uh, Hasegawa. Let's see if I can get the focus here, guys. Come on, auto auto focus. There we go. This Hasegawa Lamborghini Muria P400 Super Veloc. Um, there is also like a Lamborghini Jota that they do on the same body uh, or same kit f f chassis frame thing because the Jota was built off the Miria, but the actual Jota itself was a race car uh, that after its racing career was retired. Uh, Lamborghini made it back into a street car and it was promptly wrecked like three days later, which may be an overstatement of how soon, but it was relatively quickly. Uh, and then, I mean, it was destroyed in the accident. Uh, it was, there was nothing left. And so the Jota that they made the kit from is sort of a reproduction of the original. And, uh, I'm trying to get the glare off. There we go. Uh, this is an actual Lamborghini. The Muria was an actual, you know, car that they made. It wasn't an, uh, a, you know, a special thing. And the Muria was just something they sold. The Super Veloc was the 1971, uh, the last of the Murias. Uh, traditionally speaking, anything with an SV, the Super Veloc, uh, is the last of that of that particular body style or the model before they go on to the next thing. Um, the it was not at, right after this. Immediately, of course, there was a couple cars in between. But of course, after this, you go into the Countach's in the 19th, in the mid to late 1970s. Um, be interesting to get some of those other filler Lamborghini kits, you know, like the Esperada and stuff like that, but you can do what you can. Uh, basic curbside kit. There's no engine in here or anything else like that, but it builds into a really nice kit of a really, you know, interesting car. It's got that swoopy, almost GT40 kind of look to it and stuff like that. Um, I don't, I don't really have much else to say about that because I really haven't got a chance to dig into these yet. I just, I got them today and... <laughs> Figured I'd talk about them real quick. Um, one of the Mountain Pass cars, this uh, Honda Civic Type R, um, an EK9 late production model. Um, the EK9 late production Civic Type R is available just as a regular Fujimi inch up kit. Uh, they put them in the back of those Mountain Pass uh, series, which all of them have this box art where they're racing down the side of a mountain. Uh, made the kit even cheaper. Um, 1,800 yen is the list price, and I think they were selling them for like 1,200, 1,300 yen, which with the exchange rate made this like 990 something, ten dollars a little bit over. Um, yeah, you you can't beat that with a stick. Uh, this kit, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, has uh, left-hand drive. It's not a left-hand drive in the sense of like exporting it to the United States left-hand drive. But you can see here there is a, I mean it's the one that's upside down obviously. <laughs> There is a left-hand drive option for this. Now, that is a traditional Civic dashboard rather than the actual uh, Type R dashboard that's included. The Type R dashboard uh, is this one. And it is, of course, a right-hand drive thing. There's your wheels. Probably help if I held my hand behind them to block out the focus. But you know, it's a little, it's a you know, basic, basic curbside. You know, your basic uh, Fujimi interior tub without a skosh of detail on the side panels. Um, but at least the seats, I guess, are not molded to the floor. Um, you know, it's it's it is what it is in that sense of of you know of uh, <laughs> of the model. I mean, it's not you're not gonna you know. Uh, run right out and, and you know think you're going to start this up and turn it into a Tamiya kit or anything else like that but you know it's it's uh serviceable and the thing about these uh kits and the and the next one I'm going to show you has the same sort of uh thing is they have a new decal sheet in them that have uh sort of Japanese tuning tuning house uh type things let's see let me get this to focus and you got your 
like your uh, bride and your Colas, your Mugen Power, Abbey Road, double overhead cam sports. So, uh, you know, that's the that's the big thing about these mountain pass kits is they have these decal sheets that, uh, in addition to having the regular decals to complete the kit, all the logos and the dashboard decals and stuff like that, it also has those new, uh, you know, specialized decals. If I hold the box up to the camera on this Integra, you'll get a better look. But you see, you got, you got your endless and your Type R mines decals and stuff like that. They're actually because this can be built as a U.S. spec car. There are California license plates. Hey, <laughs> but this again, guys, is the Honda Integra Type R. Now this is really funny because I don't believe there's actually Acura logos for this to make this into an Acura. I also didn't think this had left-hand drive, to be honest with you. So uh, I have to do a little part searching here, but now there's two two gauge panels here. Huh. Well, let's see. Maybe they put parts in here that were not on the. Dis oh, hey, about that. There you go. There is left-hand drive in here. How about that? I did not realize that. <laughs> I believe that. I thought this was only buildable as a uh, right-hand drive car. How about that? Here's your your wheels on this one. And your overall body. I'm not going to take every one of these out of the box, but <laughs> this is one of these things where it was sort of a, uh, hey, how about that <laughs> thing. Yeah, let's see. Type R, Type R, Type R, Recaro... Yeah, there's no actual Acura logos. But then there don't appear to be any Honda logos either. Let me flip it over on the other side here. Nope, all Hondas, no Acuras. So you, it has U.S. plates, so I guess technically you're gray market importing <laughs> this car because, you know, in, in the United States it would, it would be an Acura Integra, not a Honda Integra. <laughs> so how about that? <laughs> Fujimi is encouraging you to... Uh, Illegally import motor vehicles into the United States. If you're not up to, up on your importing, you cannot import a vehicle that is less than 25 years old into the United States uh, because it won't ma won't meet crash testing. Now, the oddball thing about that, of course, would be that they made an Acura Integra. Why wouldn't that meet crash testing? But I guess you could just say that you took the Acura badging off and made a Honda out of it. Volkswagen GTI Golf Gen 5, uh, basic curbside. I think this is only buildable in left-hand drive, actually. Uh, so, you know, for those people thinking, ah, oh, geez, another Japanese car. This just has a big plate because it's a Euro-spec version. Um, I won't dig into this one, but it's just a, there are two versions of this. There's a, like, an R32 as well, I think. You know, let's say an R32 version that's blue box art. Uh, just something, like I said, this is uh, 2,600 yen. The D, the discount I got, it was like 14 bucks with the di with the discount and the exchange rate. What an odd kit for Fujimi to have made, right? <laughs> Fujimi made a Chevrolet Astro van. All-wheel drive. There's a two-wheel drive version of this. There's also a GMC Safari version of this. There's a couple of low-down uh, versions. There's one with wood paneling. There's uh, all sorts of things. They, they made this tooling, and they were going to get their money back out of it. Now, why, you might say, is there a Chevy Astro in Japan, right? Well, uh, it has something to do with the initial D series, the uh, cartoon series. Apparently somebody in that cartoon series drove a Chevy Astro at some point during the cartoon series, and uh, that required Fujimi, well, it didn't require them, but it <laughs> required Fujimi to go out and make a Chevy Astro uh, kit so that they could make this for their initial D series. Now, if I haven't actually ever seen the initial D series kit, which is, you know, I haven't really looked for it either, but it's not something that you come across <laughs> Uh, very frequently. This, of course, built as you know an American spec car because that's what it was, and it has caused quite the, the uh, I want to say resurgence because there was never a resurgence to begin with, but a, a real interest in Japan in this vehicle. There are probably more customized Chevy Astros in Japan than there are Chevy Astros currently on the road in the United States. I mean, think about it. when was the last time you saw one of these, really. 
and they've all pretty much rusted a, <laughs> into nothing at this point. Uh, you know, you might see them down south, down southwest, where the where the rust doesn't take a, take effect. But you know, this all goes away right here pretty much uh, within a couple years of purchase in anywhere where it snows and they put rocks on on the road. Uh, again, you know, it was for some reason they restocked this kit. Because you can buy this, you still buy this on Hobby Link Japan and Hobby Search. It wasn't like it was a, a one of one and I happened to find it, you know, sitting in the back of a dusty bin someplace. It was just what they decided to put out. Uh, no idea. I'm sure all this is telling me all sorts of cool features, but it's all in Japan and I can't read Japanese. Two more, guys. Uh, the new Fiat 500. Uh, there we go. Uh bought this one almost for two reasons. One, to complement the actual Tamiya Fiat 500F, the 1960s version of the Fiat that I'm currently building. And my wife absolutely, positively, bar none, cannot stand this vehicle. I mean, hates it with a passion unbridled by a few things other than perhaps Hitler and the Holocaust. Uh, I don't know what it is about this car she doesn't like, but she just really, really doesn't like it. So I'm going to build it for her. So she can't ever do anything but look at it. <laughs> yes, I'm evil and duplicitous like that. But really, uh, basic curbside, zero specs, so it builds left-hand drive. There are something like five or six different versions of this. There's an Aberth. There's like a Ferrari-themed one. There's like an Overland Rally-themed one. There's uh, an Italian anniversary-themed one. They got, again, Fujimi gets their money out of their tooling, whether you want to deal with it or not. Uh, it'd be kind of interesting if they would make the four-door version, the one that's kind of bigger, because that's yeah, goofy looking. My wife hates that one even more. But uh, yeah, this was this was primarily purchased to annoy the wife, because uh, every now and then they give them away on the prices right. Uh, a guy Mondays off, so I get a chance to watch uh, daytime TV on Mondays, uh, and they give it away in this awful, awful like cream color, and I happen to have that or something that resembles it very closely uh, in a. Duple color truck color. I'm not sure what color it's supposed to be, but it's real awful beige. And uh, last but not least, and this is one of those kits that really annoyed everybody when it came out. And so I, I meant to get one a while ago, and I just never got around to it. And I think I, problem with this is if I just take that, take this receipt that's shining and get rid of it. That's the problem. <laughs> Trying to figure out what, what's making the the glare on these kits. Ah, there we go. Uh, Toyota Prius. That's right. It's a Toyota Prius. Uh, touring selection. I guess we're we're selecting the touring version. <laughs> That's what Jimmy did make. Uh, anime versions of this. When the garish like Ithaca pain cars. There's one with a a solar panel on the roof. Fujimi will get their money back, folks. I don't care what you have to say. <laughs> if you like it or not, you are going to get a bunch of a bunch of kits out of out of Fujimi for any tooling they make. Uh, basic curbside, only builds JDM. Kind of disappointing. I wish it had a left-hand drive in it because that would be kind of fun. But this one right here, guys, this right here is nothing more than, A, it was cheap, and B, uh, building it and funking it down on a contest table just to annoy people. Um, when this kit was released back in 2012, or maybe even, uh, let's see, it was five, four years ago, 2011, because this is a 2010 Prius, uh, the forums went crazy. Nuts. Butt nuts. They couldn't stand it. Why were they wasting tooling on this? They, you know, and then everybody wanted to cut the hood open, put like a 350 Chevy into it, and make a hot rod out of it, and do all sorts of stupid, goofy Luddite stuff, because they were just so offended by this Prius. You know, this Prius, guys, isn't real, okay? It's it's not going to save the environment. There aren't hipsters driving it. It's just a piece of plastic. Uh, you know, and you got to remember, Fujimi especially uh, is a Japanese kit manufacturing uh, firm first and foremost. You can get them sometimes in your local hobby shop, mostly the Ferrari kits and the Lamborghini kits and the you know, other supercars that they've done. But this kind of stuff, uh, you know, we're kind of rare to see. Now, my local hobby shop actually did get one of these Priuses and that Fiat in. They were way more expensive than even at list price, let alone with the Black Friday discount that this was. Uh, but they've actually went out and bought them, too. I, they got a new distributor, and they've been distributing Fujimi kits uh, pretty hot and heavy. Um 
so you know that one that one that one right there that's just a that's a luddite annoyer i think i'm gonna take after the club meeting on monday just to just to annoy people <laughs> and then i got like a s pile of decals and we're gonna go through them like real real quick because i'm gonna bore everyone to death with them but uh from hobby easy which is my preferred brick and mortar hong kong retailer i have a couple of places uh on ebay that i'll go through for uh, hong kong but this place is an actual like building you can go to uh, this is a set of decals from Studio 27 for the Mercedes-Benz SLS AMG. This was like the presentation vehicle when they first came out with a car. Um, so it's not like a, a whole heck of a lot, you know. It's mostly uh, advertising Mercedes-Benz <laughs> to Mercedes-Benz, basically. And uh, it's just a silver car. So nothing, nothing you know, outrageous or really, really special about it per se. But it is the first one of the SLS cars, and so it'll be the first one of these that I actually make when I go to build my SLS because I have an SLS kit. I only have the one, <laughs> one kit, many decals kind of thing because uh, ooh, that was real. There we go. That's nice and sharp. It would just stay in focus now. Um, <laughs> It's, it doesn't know what to do. It's like, should I focus on the decals or do I focus on all that crap in the background? Uh, <laughs> so there's that one. That was only one decal set I ordered from from, uh, from Hobby Easy because everything else I could order through Hobby Link Japan for less money. And uh, everything else was out of stock even at uh, Hobby Search. Now, it could be a rustle in the funk here because I'm going to have to mount this microphone back because... Uh, Trying to do that with one hand is not working. <laughs> this, guys, is the carbon fiber decal set for the Alfa Romeo 155 TIV6. This is the one we've been talking about a lot <laughs> in the sense that um, we're waiting for Tamiya to reissue the kit. Uh, let's do this because this way makes more sense. Now, this is like the interior parts. There is the dashboard and the seat. And then all the rest of this stuff is uh, chassis and other interior pieces. This obviously here is like the front uh, front splash pan. Uh, you get sort of a hand-drawn decal sheet set up with these uh, that you have to sort of compare and contrast and, and make your plans with the actual Tamiya instruction sheets. Uh, this obviously only shows part of the carbon fiber kit. There's way more because the entire interior is on the other side of this piece of paper. But, you know, got a couple of little pieces there over the fenders, and then a lot of carbon fiber is on these uh, interior ductworks around the engine. So that will really look uh, really fancy uh, once the it's all done. But many pieces there. What is that? Uh, one, two, three, four five on the top and looks like seven on the bottom so ten pieces of carbon fiber per duct and there's two sets of ducts so <laughs> you know like i said i love decaling so no harm no foul there uh i already have one of these sets but we'll just throw it up here real quick this is the carbon fiber decal set for the bmw z4 gt3 i have bought another set because i have the studi uh japan there's a japan cup uh, BMW Z4 coming uh, in another shipment later, probably in March. Uh, so I got another set of these because they were in stock, and carbon fiber sets that uh, Studio 27 do are in and out of stock, like, fantastically quick. Now this is going to – I'm going to have to like, put my hand behind it so the light doesn't go through, but this is all of the decal. So it's only the seat, uh, a couple of things on the dashboard, and then everything else is external. Uh, this down here shows you a – carbon fiber to put on a dress-up piece this if you didn't buy the, the, the photo etch you don't have that part uh, but it gives you the ability to build this in a couple of different versions like there's uh, decals specifically for the 2011 version and then specifically for the 2013 version so you, you know you at least get uh, a full complement on this decal sheet in that sense and then let me do my let me sort through these real quick while I sit here and talk about it everything else here guys is going to be uh, decals for um, their livery decals. Let's see here. I'm trying to keep all my cars together. Let's see. BMW, McLaren, BMW, BMW, BMW. Uh, uh, all right. 
So from Taboo Designs, uh, this is the number 17 Sebastian Loeb Racing MP4 12C uh, McLaren. There we go. Um, you pretty much just paint the car white, and then all the stripes take care of all the rest of the problems. This is a Red Bull-sponsored car, and uh, you may recall from a discussion we had earlier about Red Bull, uh, or maybe I've never discussed this with the other set of decals for the for the BMW, but Red Bull, you know, licensed out to these different uh, decal manufacturers their, you know, logos and stuff like that, uh, and then pulled them and said, no, you can't make them that way anymore. All the Red Bull logos are down here underneath of this single sheet, uh, so you can actually, indeed, build this as a Red Bull car. What I like about this is the fact that, like, you see up here, there's just a, let me get my point and stick, there's just a line pointing to a blank space right here. Well, that's where the Red Bull logo goes. There's a bunch of lines that just go to blank spaces. <laughs> Uh, those are all where all the Red Bull logos go. Uh, the, uh, the the BMW thing has sort of like dotted outlines that show like, oh, over here you should put this decal. So <laughs> you know, all the Red Bull stuff's still there. If you really wanted to build, you know, as a Red Bull, and then you heard all the controversy about, uh, you know, oh, they took the Red Bull logos out. They're still in here. They just don't mention them anymore. That's why it's, you know, Sebastian Loeb Racing rather than being the, the Red Bull <laughs> Racing car. And then we got, uh, let's see. Three more Studio 27 uh, McLaren decal sheets. This one, the uh, GT3 for the 24 Hours of Spa in 2011. Uh, a very basic uh, design. You know, many much decals in the overall sense. Uh, but it builds a, like I said, a very basic, just an orange car. So you paint the, paint the, the kit orange. And these little sort of wood grain decals for the sides and the back take care of everything else. There's the, you can build it like, it's a 59 on, on this side. And here's the instructions on how to build a number 60 on this side. I haven't actually studied them to see how much different they are between the two because I don't like taking these <laughs> these decals out of these little mailers they put them in because they're near to impossible to put them back in because <laughs> what happens, guys, is there's a flap that comes around this side. And you can see the line right here. Is it self-adhesive, and you take it open, and then the decals stick to it when you try to put them back in there. So there's that one. And then this is the Blank Pain 2012 Racing Series uh, UnitedAutosports.com car. And this one is like the exact opposite. It's just a lot of stripes <laughs> and not a lot of, you know, anything to talk about there. Here's your number 22 or number 23. And lots and lots of of stripes, including a big wraparound. Come on, focus. Yep, yeah, I guess I just want to focus. But you see, there's everything, like, including, like, <laughs> Michigan logos for the wheel, for the tires and everything. So what this ends up looking like, guys, on the back here is this. All of the black and red is all decals, and then you just paint the car white. Nifty, right? I like this because uh, I like any any set of decals where all, most of the painting is already done for me. <laughs> and then last but not least is the uh, Lapidus Racing Team. This is for the bank, the uh, Blank Paint 2012 Racing Series. Uh, looks like uh, Chapard sponsors this this one. You can build it uh, as uh, two different versions of the number 62 car, it looks like. You know, again, you've got, like, Michigan logos for your tires, and, you know, it's all very, all these decals are very well, uh, very well registered, very little, uh, you know, clear uh, filler, or clear edging, all of it wraps, you know, all of it is very, very uh, finely detailed. This is, I mean, yeah, this, this number up here says 2,000, it's 2,000 yen, which, you know, the easy, dirty way to do that is it's 100 yen to a dollar, so this is 20 bucks, but it's really not, it's more like 16. 
with exchange rates and everything like that. But you know, so that's where you, you know, yeah, you're paying us, uh, you're paying for these decals in the sense, but uh, you know, I think they're worth it. They are really, you know, intensely uh, detailed. It looks like you can build. I'm not sure what this says because it's underneath the logo here. Hmm. I'm not gonna screw around with it. I see this says round three up here, so obviously the other one is something else. But so apparently there's two different races you can build it. And that, guys, takes us into the BMWs. This is a decal sheet that I'm actually probably going to get another one of because you can build it in two different ways that are significantly different from one another as far as what racing series that they were in. But this uh, is a, whoops, keeps, keeps flopping off my pointer. There we go. Come on, focus. Uh, but this was the basically the introductory version of the BMW. Uh, you can build like a number one, a number twenty, a number ninety-one. This is all twenty ten. So this is one of the like I said the first racing series uh, that the BMW Z4 participated in. It's got the the goofy rear wing. The rear wing actually changed uh, in like twenty twelve or twenty thirteen. It's represented in the kit. can see the, the top part of the other decal sheet building thing right there. I think one's a presentation version, which is what these like uh, premio numbers are for this version, and another one's a racing version uh, for the GT3Europe.com. <laughs> this one's going to be a little bit of painting. <laughs> this is the BMW Z4 Vita 1, or Vita 4-1 uh, racing team. Number 17, number 18, uh, 24 Hours of Nuremberg, Why well, says a lot of paintings? <laughs> Look at this. Yeah, it's like I guess it's green, <laughs> green and black. Ah, uh, two tones not covered by the decals. You're gonna have to paint that. <laughs> yeah, well, you you can't have everything the way you want it, right? You gotta you gotta you gotta step out of your comfort zone and actually paint something occasionally. But I think it's a, I think it's an interesting color scheme anyway. Just the green and black. You don't see that too much. Maybe it's more of a teal, but at any rate. Then you have the uh, 120, the uh, Roll Motorsports number 43. This is for the 2014 Monza. Uh, a buddy of mine just built this uh, set. White car, and then you just have decals for the car. <laughs> too much, too much light coming in. It's fading through my decals. And it's a real uh, basic paint scheme. It's just a white car. Uh, Roll Motorsports in 2014 also uh, fielded a second BMW Z4, and this one was driven by Alex Zanardi. Yeah, so it's basically the same sort of... Uh, look uh, as far as the graphics package uh, it's, it's just a different number car uh, and again it's just an, it's another white car so you know 
not a lot to write home about there, but it'll be an easy thing to, 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 you know, get together because you don't have to do any masking and just, you know, bomb it white and apply the decals. And then I guess we're just going to get into the really complex stuff. <laughs> I was trying to, so look, let me go this way. This way, no, 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 no. All right. So anyway, uh, this is the H2 Pharma number 12 at the Nagaro uh, Japan race in 2014. This one this is going to blow your minds, guys. <laughs> Check this out. I can get the focus. It'd blow your mind a little bit better if it was, you know, in a frame, right? <laughs> but what this looks like when it's all done, because there's more decals behind this decal sheet, is this. You paint it black, basically, and then the decals take care of everything else. <laughs> I love it. It's just so wild and out there. Uh, then you have, uh, let's see here, two of these uh, BMW Z4s that were run at uh, Elms, one in 2013 and one in uh, 2014, both by the ICOS team, uh, both number 79. Um, the 2013 is certainly fancier than the 2014, uh, but it's sort of like inverse opposites. Uh, you have this set of decals for the, this is the 2013 uh, set of decals. And this is just, you paint the car white and the decals take care of everything else. And then the 2014 looks like, you know, um, a great deal more basic in that sense. Um, trying to see if there's a second set, a second decal sheet in here. I don't think there is. I think this is just one. Uh, just a lot of white striping. <laughs> And then you're going to do the masking on this one. <laughs> There's no two ways about this one. It's supposed to be metallic blue and semi-gloss black. But I think this looks so nice that I'm um, you know, willing to take the, take the Tamiya uh, hit and get, the, uh, get my tape out. Obviously, you have to like place the decals dry and, and get a line for where the where these dividing lines are, and then go from there. But I think it's really uh, sharp, especially the real car when you see the real. Because obviously, they can't print metallic blue on these on this instruction sheet. But it's really nice car. And then we have two left that are Team Brazil and Team Russia. I'm not sure what races these were run at. It doesn't say. But they're blank pain series. Uh, Team Brazil, <laughs> wilding out there, right? <laughs> nice feud, focus. You build this in a couple of different uh, car specifications, like a zero, a twenty-one, and a thirty. Ah, there we go. And what this ends up looking at is how to put it in. Uh, this is a Nagaro Sprint Race 2014. This is on the back. Paint the car yellow. 
decals will take care of everything else. Let's try this. And last but not least, Team Russia. This one run at the Silverstone Elms 2014. Much lime green. <laughs> and you just paint the car black and the decals take care of everything else. You know, even the roof, yep, see, there's number nine pointing to the roof. Even the roof. <laughs> That'll be this big one here in the middle. <laughs> I assume that the, you know, the color printed back here is a little bit darker than the actual color of the decal, but I assume that's one of those things where it'll darken up uh, as the, you know, as you apply it over black, it'll take that color and tone it down to that. And that is, guys, what we got in the box, the shipping crate today. Uh, so let's real quick talk about uh, this idea the CT has about making a more uh, robust display, including like uh, nature features, if you want to call them that. Um, the one danger of doing that, uh, as far as contests go, and I know this because we run a contest, right, is the fact that uh, if you do that kind of thing, uh, how about we talk to me if you do that kind of thing then you uh wind up in a situation where if the base is a little bit too big uh you can very quickly get chucked into uh diorama uh, for some reason uh in the automotive section of things uh we never really got around to the idea that you can put something in a grassy field or just alongside the road and have that be a display base for a model now the military guys especially the armor guys and the aircraft guys have been doing this for decades because for a lot of tank kits and our light personnel kits and Jeeps and stuff like that, they come with figures. So if you're going to display, you know, the model, the whole thing, you need to have all of these little figurines that come with it because the, the tank guys are all doing stuff. One's driving the tank, one's pointing at something, the other one's reading the map, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. So you need to make a actual, like, base for the, the, uh, the tank so that you know it's not they're not just the, the tank sitting on the table and five guys standing around it and, it's, and there's a formica base underneath of it because that's just you know it's gonna look ridiculous there was no formica in world war ii especially not in nazi germany um so you know the the uh ipms guys have certainly gotten the entire thing of making a base down they make a basis for almost everything including car kits that's what i think it's funny people be like oh i'm gonna make a base for this and you're like doesn't need a base. You can just throw that up on your shelf. No, no, no. It needs a base. Okay. Uh, you know, at one point in time where it would have been, you know, all your base are belong to me, and now after a year of hearing it, all I hear is all about the base running through my head. And every time I th start thinking about th talking about this topic, um, you know, our contest, I think, is anything bigger than a like a four inch uh, square, bigger than the bait, bigger than the car. So basically, you know, like. A, a couple inches of each direction around the car ceases being a base, uh, especially when it has like a non, it's not mirrored and it's not used to display the chassis of the vehicle. Again, I mean, there's something you really could do about that. Uh, I can't personally rewrite the rules. Uh, and this is the way most automotive contests are. If you put grass and rocks and boulders and trees into something and stick a car into it, you've made a diorama. Uh, the only way to display a car on a base really is to make it be on asphalt. You know, here's a little section of street, and here's my car sitting on the little section of street. Fair, not fair, but that's the way it is. And I think that's the, you know, if you're building it for yourself and it's just going to be on your display shelf, CT, then, you know, it's whatever you want to do. You can make it, you know, the size of your living room, or you could just make it, you know, a little bit bigger than the model. But, uh, you know, if you're going to take it to contest, and I know that uh, he, you, however you want to look at it, does it, goes to contests, I don't know that he, you know, I'm assuming he competes when he goes to contests. Uh, I haven't watched every single backwards video to know. I just know I've seen, you know, videos of him being at contests before. That, uh, you know, if you put something on a base into a contest, there is that chance, fair, unfair, you know, argue with the, con with the judges if you want to, that it will get punted in the diorama because it's too realistic. 
All right. So anyway, like I said, what I wanted to do with my idea is that uh, a large joke had been made that I have gotten over the num- over the last number of years all of these uh, Toyotas that are behind me, all these Lexus kits and all these Toyotas. Um, I put them all on one shelf earlier uh, a week or so ago. Whoops. We're going to get seasick. Um uh, Mainly because I just want to, you know, take a picture of them and a friend of mine was like, oh, you, you got so many Toyotas. Yeah, really, they do have a lot of Toyotas. And, you know, so the joke became that I was going to make a uh, Lexus dealership for all these Lexuses that I have. Unfortunately, most of the Lexuses are right-hand drive Japanese versions, uh, like the LFA, which isn't up there because it's in my Tamiya kit collection. Uh, you know, that's is right-hand drive only. Uh the Aoshima kits are left-hand drive. The GS400, the LS400s, those are all... Uh, try, to, try to spin around and talk again. You know, they're all... These... <laughs> why don't I just stand up and display? You can follow me, right? There we go. So, like, this kit, this kit... Uh, this IS200, this SC400 are all uh, kits that have, you know, both ha- uh, both hand drives, so to speak. This LS430, this GS400, and this LS400 uh, version 2. All, again, all left-hand drive Lexuses. But this Fujimi LS460L, this and this, these are both 600 HLs. One's like a 2006, one's a 2010, and the IS250 and IS350 for whatever reason, we're all done uh, right-hand drive only, even though they're Lexuses. Because, and this HS250H, even though it is sold in the United States, again, is another car where it's only in uh, JDM right-hand drive. I would like these kits more if they had left-hand drive because, you know, I think because Lexus was a only American brand for a while when they put out these cars, uh, you know, granted, this is just a Toyota Celsius, Toyota Celsius, Toyota Celsius, Toyota Aristo. Uh, but, you know, when they ported them over here and made them Lexuses, they were left-hand drive only. And then eventually they started selling Lexuses in st- inside uh, Japan itself. And you got into the situation where, uh, you know, they just didn't bother to do them in left-hand drive. Now, the Chaser, the Mark II, this is a Chaser, this is a Mark II, and a Cresta, the 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 series of uh, triplet kits that all have a uh, 2.0 twin turbo full detail engine in these kits, these three. Uh, these are just curb sides. Uh, you know, those were never offered in the United States. The Crown Majesta is basically an LS460, but uh, on a, a not the exact same car, technically. These, crown, <laughs> these crowns are LS460s, but... Uh, Crown Majestic was a slightly larger car. The Century was, you know, the the Royal Family's car. It's an older, and then a series of older Crown Majestics. Again, all right-hand drive. And all these crowns, these are 2003s, 2005, 2008, 2010, 2013, or 2012, actually. Um, got me thinking about doing a dealership that would be more focused on gray market imports. Like I said earlier, you can't do gray market importing anymore. It was a big thing at one point in time, and then the United States government put a stop to that. Uh, most famously, most people know the gray market importing fiasco over uh, Motor X when they imported uh, R32 and R33 Skylines and uh, didn't bother to crash test them correctly, and then the government went around and tried to seize everybody's car, and it was all a big Ponzi scheme anyway, and blah, 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 blah. So now you can't import a car into the United States that was manufactured in another com- country that was not designated for sale in the United States, meaning it was crash tested and safety certified by uh, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, unless it's more than 25 years old. Uh, 2015 means that uh, some of the oldest R32 GTR Skylines are finally going to be available for importing, but nobody seems to be really lining up to do it because of the fiasco that involved uh, Motor X. And so the the idea of making a Lexus specific dealership was kind of silly. I didn't want to build 50 R, you know, 50 IS and, and uh, 350s and 250s to fill a lot out. Uh, 
So then it became more the idea of making a small, independent used car lot that would sell high-end Japanese cars. Uh, in my fantasy world, here at the Styrene Mountain, it's my place, and I can make the rules. Uh, we will become one of the first and only dealers in the United States that could import cars that were newer than 25 years old. This would be how I'd justify all the Skylines and all the GTRs and uh, all these Japanese <laughs> sedans and stuff like that. Um, so it became a situation of, like, how big is this base going to be? And, you know, because a lot of, you know, models by Chris, uh, one of the Detroit uh, Resin Automotive Group people, sells sort of like prefab uh, car dealerships and car garages and stuff like that, you know, like a, a repair garages and a drive-in and a gas, like an outdoor part of the gas station, like a canopy, like a 1950s style gas station and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it got into the point where I was using GIS maps to measure a car dealership that closed up the street as a big Ford dealership. And then it became a situation that the building itself, if you actually built it to scale in 124 scale, would take up the entire 4 by 8 sheet of plywood. Uh, and then you would have no place for, like, the lot. You'd have a couple of cars inside, and you have this monstrously large building. And the whole point was not to build a gigantic building, per se. It was uh, to build a photo backdrop and a prop, basically, for my car dealership that I want to do. And so right above me, <laughs> you, you literally go out the back of my, uh, out this wall behind me here and over the top of the hill, uh, I live on like the old state route and then the new four lanes up behind there, there's a little independent used car lot up there that has like a garage bay and it's real small, it's about 1,400 square feet and I looked at that and I dinked around with it a little bit and it's just been something that's floating around, floating around, floating around and I thought the really neat thing to do if you could pull it off would be to put a car dealership in a historic building. Now, we don't have that when we have historic buildings in Pennsylvania, obviously, but we don't have, like, Civil War-era historic buildings in that traditional sense because the Civil War wasn't fought here. I mean, Gettysburg, Chambersburg, out east, sure, but not here in Pittsburgh. We're uh, much more well-known for the French and Indian War, uh, and pretty much that's it. <laughs> George Washington slept here, that kind of thing, but... You know, w you know, there was a little Revolutionary War action, but most everything was east and south of here. Now, I'm originally from the state of Virginia, so I started looking at places that would have car dealerships that were in, like, you know, Civil War era historic buildings, because there has to be something, right? Somebody's turned a house into a car dealership. Uh, and, you know, I was looking around, looking around, and I got through all these various uh, real estate websites and stuff like that, and uh, what I wound up with was not finding anything that I wanted to do. I could find, like, recently closed, you know, 1960s era big dealerships. I got one of those right up the street. Two of them, actually. One's a paint place now, and the other one's just falling into the ground. Uh, but I found the place that, by accident, and I couldn't get back to it if I wanted to, I took a little searching on Google uh, Earth today to find it again because I just saw it on this real estate website on my phone, and then I didn't make any kind of, you know, save notes of how to find it again. Uh, there's a little, like a two-bay garage, one garage on one side, one garage is on the uh, outside. Uh, little independent car lot down in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Now, this is where I am originally from. It is three blocks from the beach on Virginia Beach Boulevard, which is the main drag in and out of the oceanfront area. Uh, it's not the main drag of the oceanfront area. That's Atlantic Avenue. But if you want to get to the beach, you're on Virginia Beach Boulevard pretty much without without cause you're going to wind up going down the street and uh it's kind of a funny building because uh if you go on google earth and you look at it uh on, on street view it's under one set of ownership on one street and one set of ownership on another street and i don't know how well this is going to actually show up because i'm going to try to show you through uh my <laughs> uh computer if i can get the the windows in the background of the camera to actually focus there we go um, I'm gonna try try to do this. This will be interesting because usually you get a lot of you know bad layering whenever you try to show a a, a computer image on uh, you know webcam. But uh, oops, <laughs> sorry guys. Don't make don't mean to make you motion sick. I gotta. You're gonna see. You're gonna see yourself here for a second because I want. I need to see how close I am to being on target. Yeah. 
Okay, guys, so there it is. Like I said, there's this bay on this garage side. The guy, I don't know if he's flipping the double deuce to the yeah, to the Google uh, car or not. At least he's saying, hey, how you doing? And then there's a garage bay on the front side of the building that's uh, over this way. Um, this is not quite the uh, high-end selection that we're going to be offering at our car dealership, but this building uh, is exactly what I was looking for, both in location and in uh, what it is. There's not a lot of construction involved in here. The building is 50 by 50, so it's 25 inches on each side, um, or 20 inches on each side, I should say. Uh, well, no, it's, it's a little over uh, two feet square, basically. And then this parking lot is uh, 150 by 200, so it'll fit on a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood. And that was the main concern. And we're going to sort of scooch around the neighborhood here real quick. while we wait for this to resolve. Now we're on Virginia Beach Boulevard. That's Baltic Avenue over there to the right. And uh, see, it's under a different ownership. Now it's VirginiaMotors.net. <laughs> and the inventory looks pretty much the same. I think the place the guy bought the cars and the whole building. But you see it has a garage bay on the front there and, uh, you know, the garage bay on the side. This is obviously an old service station because uh, it has, like, restrooms on the side. And obviously, you know, it will change the one front. This, this old establishment here it had uh, window tinting. <laughs> as a service. Uh, so, you know, that's the idea, is building this place pretty much from the sidewalks back. We're not going to build the street itself. Hang on while we readjust the camera. I'll make sure I was actually in the frame. <laughs> All right, so sorry for the pause there, guys. But uh, I, could, I wanted to put it as just a picture, and it would not save from Google Earth for whatever reason. But that's the I, I think it's the building we're to go with. Uh, looks like if you double stack them like the like the new place does, you can fit about 50 cars in there. But we're looking for like 12, 14 cars at a time. I have to build some sort of cover on it so that the cats don't get on it and knock the building on the floor and stuff like that. And this is, of course, all stuff for uh, well into the future. Uh, it's one of those catch twenty twos. Do I build the the diorama base first, or do I start building model cars first? Uh, obviously, build the cars first, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, look at that. We're almost an hour into this. Yeah, you've waited around this long, and so the the idea is we're gonna have a whole bunch of different uh, rigs made up. Um, trying to see if I could do this without knocking everything down. Nope, apparently not. This uh, European rig, uh, this Italo Re Volvo kit will be used to pull an Italo Re 40-foot container, and that'll be, uh, you know, how we get our cars from uh, Europe, <laughs> when we import cars directly from the European continent. Because there's some cars on, you know, in Europe that weren't made here. Um, too buried for me to actually dig out is uh, the Mitsubishi Fuso car hauler. The Mitsubishi Fuso car hauler will be our Japanese car hauling solution for all the cars that get taken to the docks. One of the benefits of being in Virginia Beach is the state port of Virginia is right down there. Um, hmm. This Mobius Lone Star will be used to pull a 44-foot Galaxy Limited trailer. Now, I forgot to take the picture off my phone. Now, a lot of people argue with me that that's not a combination that actually exists in real life. Uh, um, yeah, it is. Actually, there's a Lamborghini dealership in Chicago that runs two trucks. Uh, one's an older Freightliner, one's a new Kenworth. And they're just white trucks, and they just say Lamborghini down the side of them without the logo, just the word Lamborghini and the Lamborghini script. And then they're pulling great big enclosed car haulers behind them because that's how you move a hand-built limited edition car. Uh, you ain't put nothing on a, on a 10 rack car, car hauler with a bunch of Chevy Cruises and Ford F-150s. So the, the, uh, the Lone Star will pull the big, big 44 foot trailer, which uh, is way back there in the corner, <laughs> right there. This one is a 38 foot uh, gooseneck enclosed car hauler, and that's going to go behind a variety of dually pickups. 
um, a we have I have the the, the classic you know monogram F what, F350 dually, and I've got a couple of Snapfast AMT kits, the Dodge Ram dually, and the Chevy uh, Silverado dually. Um, I have a Mobius Pro Star. The Mobius Pro Star is going to be pulling our shop truck, which is this thing right here. The shop truck will be our mobile sales platform. This is an old Revell of Germany kit. I bought it assembled at the car at our uh, well, not our because I don't belong to the club, but the fall contest we have here in, in Pittsburgh. This is an old Revell of Germany uh, trailer. They made this trailer in two different ways. One is just like a step deck that had the construction equipment on it. And then there's this racing team version that was pulled by a, a, a truck and then had a matching racing truck on the back. Uh, it was really ludicrous because the uh, American racing truck had a sleeper on it. You would never s race a over-the-road truck. Uh, but it was later done in, you know, both kits were done by Revell of Germany. But it was most recently uh, reissued many years ago, but recently in that sense. Uh in this format with a Scania truck and a Scania race car, uh, Scania race truck behind it. Um, the Revell, uh, Revell US, a lot of people think it's Revell Germany. Uh, it was because of how muddled the tooling is. It was designed in the United States and it was like molded in Denmark or something like that, but it's technically a Revell US tool because it's 125th scale. They have that new car hauler, the reissue, I should say, of that car hauler from the 1980s that's going to be coming out mm, some point because all of Revell's uh, you know, kits are so far behind right now. And uh, Italy is reissuing at some point uh, the Volvo VN series truck, which is the North American Volvo truck, the big, you know, the truck with a big nose on the front, more of a conventional style truck than that, that uh, cab over I just showed you. And... Uh, Really popular. I work uh, about two miles up the street from the Pittsburgh Mannheim Auto Auction, and we see constantly Volvo trucks attached to what is a five or six position, 25, 30 year old trailer. I mean, as long as the hydraulics will run on those car haulers, they'll run them until the ground because they are expensive. Uh, a five position, six position, what they consider to be a gooseneck trailer because it's not combined into the tractor. You know, when you get one of those big fancy Peterbilt. Uh, or Western Star Car Haulers, where it has racks over the tr over the top of the truck, and it's connected by what's known as a stinger uh, pivot, where the pivot's actually like you know underneath <laughs> down here rather than on top like a regular truck would be. Uh, those are like you know quarter million, if not more, expensive trucks. A five position car hauler is still a hundred thousand dollars plus. So if you're going to, you know, go out and buy one of those things, you're going to keep it until it literally will not be roadworthy anymore. Uh, so, you know, you see them a lot in the independent down market used car guys that, you know, go to the auction, they buy five or six cars from the from the, the big Mannheim Auto Auction, and they send out their car hauler to go get them. So that will be uh, another truck option. Now, obviously, uh, the neighborhood that the, the, the dealership's in in real life is not going to be recreated here, so the building next door that sells tents and camping supplies won't be there. It'll be a vacant lot, and that'll be where we park some of the equipment. It'll never be a situation where we have all of it there at one time, because obviously some of it will be out delivering cars, and some of it will be out picking up cars, and all that you know nonsense. I'm going to get one of those 20-foot Italian containers just to put on the ground, because, again, we're right next to the port, so, uh, you know, there will always be a container there to either put cars in or take cars out, because uh, as well as importing cars from overseas, we'll be exporting muscle cars and American, uh, you know, high-performance vehicles out of the country, because, you know, we've got to have that market going two ways, right? So, <laughs> there, guys, there's an insight into my insanity for what I like to do uh, large scale. Uh, I would like it to not be the entire four by eight sheet of plywood because that would be just be you know, ridiculously huge. Something in the neighborhood of a half a sheet of plywood probably be better. If I can figure out a way to make like folding legs on it, like a uh, card table where they would lock in an out position, but they could be folded up underneath. Like I said, I'd like to be able to take it outside occasionally and shoot pictures in the sun rather than just in the basement, um, and be able to take it to a couple of different events that we do in the model club. Uh, because, you know, other other members can put their cars on it and stuff like that. We have a great big like, parking lot thing that we put up for our club display, but this would be a little bit different um, and uh, unique, I think, in the in the realm of club displays. And, uh, you know, this is really we way off CT's uh, question, but I know a lot of people have been like, I really enjoy, you know, getting to know you. Maybe you didn't want to get to know me for an hour and six minutes per se, but uh, just another look into what we're planning to do here. So, uh 
puttering around with kids, really haven't gotten much done with them. There's nothing to show per se. Uh, but we got these, like I said, we got these. Some of these Studio 27 decals in here will go into effect uh, immediately. I'm going to start working on the the SLS AMG and the BMW, and uh, we'll see what comes of it all. So anyway, guys, we'll see you on the other side.